So about 4.4 billion years ago, water appeared on Earth. And then maybe only a few hundred million years after that, life evolved in the warm and salty oceans of this beautiful blue planet. And so it was for some billion years more until life climbed ashore from the oceans and eventually evolved into the cognitively unique forms of human beings that we are today. And in a way, this is a talk about the foundations of life. It's about water and the role of water in the brain, about the brain's water source. And whenever I talk about water and the body, I like to start with the story of Hylas, the Greek myth of Hylas. So Hylas was a prince, and after his father's death, he joined Hercules and Jason and the band of Argonauts on their quest for the golden fleece. And they were sailing on the oceans and they needed fresh water. So Hylas, our friend here, was sent to the island search for fresh water. And in this pond, he met these freshwater nymphs, the naiads, the nymphs, and he disappeared and was never seen again. <laughs> but the Greek word nymph is the same word as the Roman word lymph or lympha. Lympha was the Roman goddess for fresh water. And it's lympha that our lymphatic system is named out. So in your entire body, you have a lymphatic system. It's filled with lymph, a clear water-like fluid. And you have it in your entire body, even in the membrane surrounding your brain, but there's no lymphatic system in the brain itself. Which begs two questions. Why is there no lymphatic system there? And second, are there alternative mechanisms that play the role of the lymphatic system in the brain? And the fun bit is that we really don't know. No one knows the answers to this question. The subject is very poorly understood, but there's a really rich setting for mathematical modeling and computational models. Is there's really limitations in experimental and clinical techniques. So this is what we are trying to address. So we, our research is focused on understanding biophysical mechanisms underlying water and solute transport in the brain. And the interaction between the brain and the fluid surrounding it. We're working across kind of this is a this is a this is a big field. We're doing research in many fronts, including this tracking solutes, how these um, move through the brain. The solids could be proteins associated with uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, or it could be potential drugs for targeting cancer tumors. We're looking at the brain's mechanics, how the forces, strains, and stress and displacement of the brain. We're looking at the fluid mechanics of the cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, surrounding the brain. And we're looking at the role of these processes in neurodegeneration using various mathematical uh, and computational techniques. So I thought I'd talk about many of these things. And then I started and I realized that would be an eight hour talk. So I'm going to focus on just one of these here today, talk about the mechanics of what research we're doing on um, mathematical modeling of brain mechanics. This is, of course, not only my work, it's really the work of my wonderful team of postdocs and PhD students. And I'd like to emphasize Bea Gardenia, as a former PhD student of mine, Eleanor Piersanti. Uh, and Marius Kausman, the current PhD student of mine, have done much of the work we're seeing today. Okay, so with that, let me give some background, physiological background. What do we know about the brain from a poor elastic perspective? So, if we're looking at the brain at the organ level, which is what we'll do at the macro scale, the brain, what you think of as the brain, is usually called the brain parenchyma. This is the wobbly bit that looks like a brain that Igor brings. Some people, Igor says, bring me brains, Igor. That's, that's the brain parenchyma. It sits inside your skull and it's surrounded by three membranes or meninges. The innermost is the pia membrane that really holds the brain in place. 
Then there's a layer of cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, which is this clear water-like fluid, and the so-called arachnoid membrane, right like there. Between the arachnoid and the pia, you have the so-called subarachnoid space. Then outside the arachnoid, you have the dura membrane, which I won't care about. And then you have this. <clears throat> so if we're focusing mainly on the brain parenchyma, and the brain parenchyma is elastic, I'll get back to that, but it's also permeated by a number of different fluid networks. So the obvious thing are blood vessels. Blood vessels come up from the heart, up, neck, go around the surface of the brain, and then dive into the brain. When these blood vessels dive into the brain, they're often called penetrating arteries. So this is a high pressure, pulsatile blood flow. Then the arteries branch into the capillary levels, and then on the venous side, you get a reduction in pressure and pulsatility. So blood vasculature forms one fluid network in the brain, but there are more. There's also the space between the cells, the brain cells, that are called, that's called the extracellular space, usually abbreviated ECS. This is also a network, a fluid network. It's filled with interstitial fluid, which is very similar to cerebrospinal fluid. And from a mathematical perspective, it's essentially water. Um, this is a narrow and tortuous space. So you can also think of that as a fluid network inside the brain. And in addition, there's something called perivascular spaces. So in the rest of the body, you have the lymphatic vessels. You don't have those in the brain, but surrounding the blood vessel, it's conjecture that there exist fluid-filled spaces like annular cylinders surrounding the blood vessels, called perivascular spaces. And that's filled with TSF or ISF, these water-like fluids, yet another fluid. Level. And really the brain is mainly water, it's 80% water, it's about 20% extracellular space. Um, and so you really can look at this kind of a generalized fluid network occupied in those systems. What else do we know about the brain? Well, brain is surprisingly soft. It's really held in place by this pia membrane surrounding it. It's about a, it has about a shared spot with around one kilopascal. It's very soft. It's also complex in terms of elasticity. It has nonlinear behavior, it shows viscoelastic behavior, it shows poor elastic behavior, it shows, I'm sure, a thermal and mechanical behavior, and it's heterogeneous. It differs from region to region in the brain. So depending on the scale in terms of time you're interested in looking at, these different behaviors of the brain become more or less relevant. And the scales that we're looking at in time is the cardiac or respiratory cycle. So we're talking seconds, minutes, our space will focus on the plural elastic properties of the So let me say a bit more about this extracellular space. This is the space between cells. It's a narrow and tortuous space, but it does occupy about 20% of the brain. And if you're talking about interested in tracking movements of solids, drugs or toxic proteins in the brain, it's very interesting to understand how these solids can move either in their extracellular space or in the inside the cells. And clearly they can move by diffusion. Everyone agrees that these particles can move by diffusion. It's a big and hot topic and a lot of controversy in the physiological field, but there are other mechanisms as well. Some have proposed that there's a bulk flow of extracellular fluid in the extracellular space. Which may be that the permeability of extracellular space is very small. It's on the order of tens, hundreds, thousands of nanometers squared. It's very low permeability. Another thing that's been proposed is that maybe there's also fluid movement in these paravascular spaces. So these paravascular spaces are annular spaces surrounding the blood vessels. There are lots of open questions about them. And again, this is why mathematical modeling is so fun here, because there's a lot of controversy in this field. Very little is settled in stone. Even the most basic questions have remained kind of physiologically unanswered. And many theories are proposed by bi biologists who are published by biology, but sometimes do propose physical theories that are not linked to basic laws of physics. So let me show you uh, a video from some of the leading experimental group. This is will be a video from the brain's mice. It's on the right here. 
Um, so these are three slices uh, of a part of the brain cortex. The slices are further inside the brain. And the upper slice, what you see there in red, are blood vessels on the surface of the brain. What they've done in their experiments in mice is that they have mice more or less running about, and they're injecting a fluorescent tracer inside the fluid compartments outside the brain. And they see how this trace is spread. And they do that in order to understand these pathways for spread. So the fluorescent tracer is in green. <clears throat> and what they observe is that it starts spreading along these vessels first. First on the surface, and then further down. So it's believed that this flow in these paravascular spaces, which may be actual spaces or, or just uh, a preferential pathway surrounding the blood vessels, is believed to be a key mechanism in anything that has to do with understanding solid transport in the brain. They clearly exist on the, on the surface of the brain, but it's unclear to what extent they exist further down. Uh, and their importance is also debated. But what's important for us is that it defines a fluid network. It's paravascular spaces. In addition, brain tissue is it's not static, obviously, uh, but it also evolves with age. So its properties, its elastic properties, uh, the volume fraction of extracellular space and so on uh, varies with age and with Neuro neurological or neurodegenerative disease. So it's interesting to study this mechanical properties of the brain in that context. And it also varies with other um, factors, such as, for instance, sleep. So 10 years ago, this field received a lot of attention, partly because maybe there was an article suggesting that maybe this is why we sleep. Why do we sleep? Well, the volume fraction of the extracellular space, alpha, is higher when you're sleeping than when you're awake. So maybe it's easier for solids to move in the brain when you're sleeping. Maybe the brain acts, the sleeping acts as this restorative, really by physical cleansing mechanism for the brain. This is still very um, controversial, I would say, but it, I mean, it makes it interesting, right? And what how these properties and chemical properties of range. Okay, so that's the physiological background. Now you know all you need to know about. Yeah. So okay. just uh, one question about uh, this uh, very interesting uh, fact. So is it only re um, due to the fact that you're uh, lying when you sleep, or is it related to some other physiological mechanisms? This is measured in mice. Uh, so ah, in mice. mice. <laughs> Uh, are pretty much yeah. in more or less the same position, whether they are sleeping okay. or they're so it's, it's awake. Different. So it's, not, it's probably not related to that. Okay. Most of, um, some of the data I'm showing you is from mice, some of it will be from humans. Mm -hmm. Very hard to do, a um, lot of controlled experiments <laughs> on human brains, as you can imagine. This is, there's a surprisingly little data available. <laughs> Maybe not so suppressing. So that's why some of these, where you have controlled experience, mice is the low term. Okay, so how do we model this generalized for elastic material? Well, we'll take this homogenized macro scale um, point of view, and we'll start with um, let me just start with Bio's equations. So let me just do, do this a little bit carefully so that we're all, I make sure that everyone's on the same page here. So these equations are the standard equations for modeling kind of small displacements of a poroelastic medium. And a poroelastic medium is, is some elastic matrix formated by one uh, porous phase, typically water. And the equations is a couple system of linear equations, time dependent. And you're interested in finding a displacement uh, here. Displacement U as a function of space and time, and a pressure V, often known as the pore pressure or the fluid pressure, or sometimes you call it the network pressure, also a function of space and time, such so as balance of mass and momentum force. So I'm interested in looking at the brain 
during cardiac or respiratory pulsations, there are small deformations. This is not enlarged. This is not car crashes. This is not traumatic brain injuries. These are small deformations of the linearized regime. Makes sense. So we have balance momentum here, stating that the divergence of the elastic stress, sigma u, minus alpha, where alpha should be your Willis coefficient, and p is equal to sum up. Then you have the time derivative. You have a so-called specific storage coefficient f. Again, the pressure. Again, the same alpha. Uh, and here's the divergence of the hydraulic conductance kappa and the is equal to g. So the second one is balanced on mass. We also see in this linear elastic stress strain relationship given by Hooke's law, where you have the domain parameters mu and lambda. Typically, S will be very small. Alpha will be somewhere between zero and one. We don't care too much about alpha. And kappa can also be very small. Lambda will typically be very big. So, for uh, the other questions, describe an elastic matrix permitted by one fluid network. But in the brain, as I mentioned, you have blood networks with different pressures and cross properties. You have perivascular networks, you have extracellular networks, and not natural to lump all those networks into one. So what we're really should look at is this generalized for LSTC in the sense that we now consider one tissue, one elastic tissue, but it's permeated by multiple fluid networks. So how do the equations change? Well, we're still interested in finding displacement here, but now I have J, J corresponding to the number of networks, pressures, PJ. So that so again, balance and momentum holds, and again, balance and mass holds. J will not be very, J will not be infinity. J can be like two, three, four, it's, it's maybe 10, but, but it's not something that, that goes to infinity. Um, how do these equations change from the other equations? Well, now you have a sum of pressures here, contributing to the balance and momentum, weighted by one Beer-Willis coefficient for each network. And now you have one balance of mass equation for each network. And what happens in each network is either you can have the transport within the network, movement of pressures and, and flow within the network, or one network can transfer its fluid to another network. You can have water moving from the blood into the extracellular space, for example. And this is described by the transfer term T, Tj. Um, and Tj we, is subject to modeling, but what we'll assume is that we'll give it a linear relation with transfer coefficients. So what comes into, transfers into one network J will be proportional to the difference between that network and the other networks with some transfer coefficient gamma J out between the networks. These transfer coefficients will assume that they are symmetric and positive. So the case J plus one corresponds to Bios equation. J plus two is called bar and blood Bios equation. And there's a number of interesting parameter regimes in this equation. I think these equations were introduced by by and elsewhere in Rogers in the context, or maybe earlier than that as well. But at least they discuss this in this form in the context of geophysics and geomechanics. And then Tony and Mentikos proposed using this in the context of brain modeling about 10 years ago. And it's been used in modeling a bit, but it's not really been studied much numerically. So that's what we've been interested in for the last five years or so. Uh, and I'll go through some of that analysis now. So just be sure. So for you, like three, three will be, will be okay. Three is a very good. Uh, <laughs> three is a very good. Uh, I have examples with three. Yeah, okay. yeah. Cool. We've run some with eight, but, but that's kind of. Uh, yeah, because then then you have very difficult choice of calibration when you have so many things. Same for the top. Yeah, it's just way too many parameters to uh, to uh, choose. <laughs> but uh, but it's it's hard to do just one. That that is that's not so easy. So when when analyzing these questions, both the other question, this wonderful network equations, it's very useful to think of them as a coupled elliptic parabolic problem. So what's a coupled elliptic parabolic problem? Well, this 
This is a framework that was probably introduced earlier, but which was studied by Erna Mani in a beautiful, beautiful paper uh, from 2009. And I'll just use their notation. So in the general sense, a couple of elliptic problem variational form can be written here. So we're interested in finding a U in some space VA. You can think of VA as H10, for instance. Uh, and P, such that for each time it will be in some BD, maybe again H10, as we're in, if you're thinking of the O as an example, such that this elliptic problem holds and this parabolic equation. So let me just make this more concrete by looking at how VO is an example here. So this VO fits this general framework if we take VA H10 uh, vector fields for the displacement and VD H10 scale fields for the pressure. And then we identify A as this uh, elastic form. B is a style for P divergence of U in here. Um, the superimposed dot is the time derivative. C is this L2 in a product weighted by the specific storage coefficient paths. And for D, have this typical Laplacian that's weighted by the um, hydraulic conductors. So, Bio is one example that fits in this couple that is And then Hanumanya introduced some assumptions for these type of problem, this general framework, this general problem is satisfied. And if these assumptions are satisfied, then we'll have stability of solutions that will have uniqueness of new solutions. And what are the assumptions? Well, the assumptions are that VA and ED are Hilbert spaces and that there exist larger Hilbert spaces, LA and LD, such as VA and ED is that. Um, and we'll also assume that, uh, they also assume that A, uh, and D are symmetric closed and continuous perpendicular forms. And the same for C when viewed as a map from LD and L D into L. And then we also assume that B uh, is continuous on its basis, and the C norm is such that it's also continuous. So this is also a very use, this is a very useful framework. Um, so the question becomes if this multiple network parallel assistive equations also fit the framework. And if we look at this at corresponding displacement pressure formulation of the multiple network equations, and we can define A is the same. Now, P is now several P's. It's the two pull of the network pressures. We define A as before for B all. For B, we now just have a weighted sum of pressures weighted by the alpha rather than just one alpha times P. Similarly for C, we now have a sum of specific storage coefficient terms. And for D, we now both have a sum of these uh, second order uh, terms, but we also have the transfer terms. And then we define the natural extensions of the spaces. So VA H is S before, LA is before, but now VB is J pressures, so J times H10, and similarly for LD. Now, this gives a very strong formulation of the impact equations in this couple of elliptic parabolic framework. The question remains whether these assumptions fit. And for the first ones, uh, it, essentially it follows as for B all. These spaces are Hilbert spaces and dense as before. A is the same as for B all, so it's still symmetric, coercion, and continuous. As long as the, all of the specific storage coefficients Sj are positive, C is also still positive. So it, it does not cover the case where any of the Sj's is zero, which is a relevant case. Uh, but this theory does not cover that. And clearly B is also continuous for the choices of alpha that are interesting. The only thing that's a little bit uh, different, I would say, is, is regarding this term D, because you also have the presence of just but if D is also symmetric course and continuous, then we have stability and uniqueness for these weak solutions of this equation. So let's see about D. So D, of course, is indeed, as uh, it's uh, symmetric, it is so and it's continuous, but let's see why. So by definition, D of a tuple pressure P and a tuple Q uh, is given by the sum. 
And the interesting bit, so here to experience um, symmetric, here to this space will lead to us over the cup of J, uh, our posture. And here to this will also lead to this in the building. Yeah. So the question is just about these transfer So since we have the symmetry of these transfer provisions, we can shuffle this double sum here, which is the definition of these transfer coefficients, into a symmetric form. So by shuffling, I think modern A, it's actually easy just to see that this becomes this. Um, we will instead have half the sum over J and I, gamma J and I, is P J minus P I and Q J minus Q I, and the inner product of this uh, analysis. So in this form, it's easy to see that this is indeed symmetric. And it's also easy to see now that if we take P here, we'll get the H1 seminal weighted by the hydraulic conductance. And we'll also get this term here, which definitely will be positive. Maybe zero, it may easily be zero for non zero piece, but at least it will be not negative. Uh, and similarly, so if all the hydraulic conductances are positive, it will be coercive. And at this point, we have an upper bound on the conductors and then the transfer parameters will also continue. So under these assumptions, the upper systems really do have unique solutions, and the upper has the right to this. So then many also define space and time discretizations of these problems, define discrete problems, and under some additional very reasonable set of assumptions, also can derive a priori and a posteriori error estimates for the discrete for the general couple problem and a posteriori for the examples. And since we've shown this for the MPEG, these error estimates, both a priori and a posteriori estimates, follow for the impact. And so this is this framework used to derive, actually, my master's student, Emilia Nisesni, used to derive a posteriori error estimates for the MPEG questions in this standard discourse. Okay, so now we have a uh, governing equations framework. We're interested in modeling brains, so now we just need some brains. Okay. So we are so fortunate as to collaborate with a really pioneering group of clinicians at Basel University Hospital that do their um, neurosurgeons and neuroradiologists working with a group of neurological patients that have various problems with the cerebrospinal fluid flow disturbances. So as a standard part of their standard clinical routine, they're the only team in the world that when they get patients that fulfill certain criteria, they're allowed to insert tracer in their, in their fluid surrounding their brain, image how this tracer moves inside the brain. But they also do, they do a long, many times of imaging. They do. T1 weighted magnetic resonance imaging that gives you structural information of the brain, which is what you see here. But they can also do diffusion tensor imaging, which tells you something about directionality of, of fiber directions in the brain. And they can measure tracers, they can look at the fluid and so on. So we have developed a pipeline to go from images like this uh, of either patients or healthy volunteers. And then you can use a software called FreeSurfer, which is the de facto state of the art for extracting surfaces from these type of images. So you'll get a surface representation of the interface between the brain and its surrounding subarachnoid space. This white bit here. Uh, and you can also get surfaces between the gray and white matter. These surfaces are designed and have been designed and used for people in psychiatry, psychology, neuroscience for 20 years for measuring geometrical properties, like the thickness of the cortex, the outermost layer of your brain. They're not typically being used for finite element simulations. So they're, they're not kind of designed for meshing. So we, we can use these standard tools to extract the surfaces, but then you just do the post-process surfaces, remesh and smoothen them, uh, which we're using Gmesh and Gmesh and for, for smoothing these surfaces, and then you can do volumetric meshing of these things. You can also extract additional information, such as EGI and antibody. We have actually just uh, published a book on, on describing this page pipeline from images to including all the information 
in order to run finite elements on relations on human meshes, complete with uh, human brain data sets and, um, and the simulation software. So if you'd like to run simulations on brains instead of unit cubes or unit squares, sometimes, at least I like that for a bit of variation, uh, this is a freely available disk. So here's one example of how we're combining this uh, numerical and computational frameworks. So we looked at one example in order to see can these generalized pluralistic equations um, give quantitative and qualitative information that seem meaningful to a model in the brain. So now we considered three fluid networks, good catch. So we're considering two blood networks and one perivascular network. So we're considering one relatively high pressure arterial slash capillary event network. We're considering one venous blood network. And we're considering one perivascular space network filled with water. Season. And we're considering half a brain that have in the hemisphere here. And we inject what, how do we make something happen? So what we do is that we inject blood everywhere in this uh, arterial blood network. So it's a source that's distributed inside the entire brain. It's uniform in the entire brain. And then we let it pulse it inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, just, just in general, in terms of, it's a source term that is uh, for, uh, source term everywhere. Um, and the answer from the pressure equation. In, yeah, yeah, G, yeah, the pressure know. equation in the first network. Uh, in the first network, in the third. Okay. And then we can predict uh, displacements. And we see that we get displacements up to 0 0.5 millimeters. This is with kind of measured elastic parameters. So this, this seems reasonable. You get volume changes around uh, 0 0.5 cubic centimeters, which is also what you would expect. And you get nearly homogeneous pressures in some of the compartments, uh, while you do have pressure gradients in other compartments. So it looks at least at least kind of a zero order reason. And then we also how do you, how do you got some considerable parameters from LMRs? How I get the parameters? Yeah, so there are relatively um, trustworthy, I would say, elastic parameters. For brain tissue, for the for the stiffness uh, of brain tissue, um, the shear modulus, that is the one, maybe the one thing that's almost not. So the incompressibility of the brain is believed to be almost incompressible. And that would be homogeneously distributed, yeah. or do you have? Yeah. Okay, but so here we just let it be. Uh, here for this example, I just let it be mm -hmm. homogeneous, but. The, the mesh I'm using here has kind of a separation into gray and white matches, and there are also recently uh, literature values for the uh, elastic um, properties in gray and white matter. Um, for the fluid networks and for the fluid modeling here, this is all that are off. You have some estimates for the permeability, but that varies by, and that's the best, but maybe the permeability in these extracellular perivascular spaces is what you can rely on the most, but still that varies by three or so many. Yeah, this is not a field. This is not a field where you are computing things to plus minus five percent. Okay, this is this is a ballpark inside, and you do need to. It's a very good. That's a very good question. That's a very good observation because it makes we ask completely different questions than the ones where you have like you know, maybe. Airplanes, right, or food flow right away, where you have these benchmarks and you're interested in, in approximating something to one percent or zero point one percent. That's not the case. That's not the situation that we're If we're in the full part of one order of magnitude, you're very happy. Which is why we're also using adaptivity uh, for these type of models, and we're interested not in order to get to a precise error tolerance. That's not relevant, but we're interested in seeing can we use adaptive and guide a posterior estimate guide and mesh refinement in order to get more accurate solutions. Um, so we, we use these a posterior estimates that we get from the Anamania framework and implement them for this equation and evaluate them on this physiologically realistic test case. 
And we do see that the adaptive algorithm works in the sense that it reduces the error. It also seems to improve the solution accuracy. So that's good. And we've of course also tested this on unit square synthetic, synthetic case cases, but everything works beautifully. But I would like to highlight something that this physiological and kind of complex example shows is that suddenly choices you make in adaptivity that often are brushed under the rug in many settings are not considered very interesting become very important. For instance, we this Ernest analysis gives our indicators of kind of a logarithmic range. This is a plot with a log scale. So the red ones are, are 10 orders of magnitude larger than the blue ones. So this means your choice of marking strategy suddenly becomes quite influential. If you take the one that contributes to 10% of the error, you'll be refining one cell over time. For um, and also, we're using conforming meshes, but they if you do local refinement, even with a very little local refinement, propagation of the meshes in this efficiency. So you very quickly get that. Okay. Mm, shall I, since there's some questions in between, shall I stop at 11.45 or how do you prefer? No, no, it's, uh, it's okay, so let's aim at 11.50. <laughs> Okay, so let me talk a little bit about, um, about robustness and parameter limits. So as I mentioned, the Bjorg's equations are, and multiple network equations are very fun because there's many, they have a very interesting structure and many different limits. So if we just start by looking at Bjorg, you get the symbol for the embed equation. Bjorg's equations, if you take the limit of incompressibility, it's a very relevant limit for the brain, and the limit where lambda goes to infinity, you ask questions that I listed here. What happens when lambda goes to infinity? Well, if we also think of the case s equals zero, that's now left s equals to zero because that exaggerates any difference. Then the divergence of u becomes zero, essentially. S is zero, this is zero. So the system decouples into two systems, one elasticity system and one Darcy filter. So that's an interesting case. I also have the case that's where you have nearly impermeable. As I mentioned, the extracellular space in the brain is essentially nearly impermeable. So it's a question whether one should model it, but if one chose to model it, you would definitely be in this impermeable regime where kappa is very small. So what happens then? Well, this one is zero, this goes away, and you'll end up in this. Um, uh, the Stokes like system, really, there should be a divergence in U and a G here, but you'll end up in this. So, as you can imagine, this has been studied. We also questions numerics for the view, and these parameters have been studied by many people. Um, and, and we've done some related to the empathy groups. So, I think I'll go through the case of the incompressible case where lambda is, is very big. I can take questions about the other thing. So it's very easy if you consider a synthetic case case for kind of smooth solutions, fine fine solutions on a unit square for these empty equations <laughs> to lose approximability of the displacement. And by that I mean that you expect the displacement to converge at second order, but you only observe the first order uh, convergence. You could also observe, which has been observed by, I think this is Rose and Mueller. Um, you can also observe these strange patterns in either the pressures or the displacement of all the stresses. This is a problem known as volumetric locking that's well known from holistic speed. And a part of the problem one can understand by looking at this bilinear form A, and which is given by the elastic stress sigma u and the strain epsilon. So you define as this, and we can see that when lambda goes to infinity, your continuity bound for A also goes to infinity. So the constant C here depends strongly on, on lambda. So you lose you know, you, your constant in your error space. Um, the problem is a bit more complex than that, but that's at least one indication of the problem. So what do you want to do? So there's many strategies for hacking this in elasticity, and all of them, not maybe not all of them, but many of them rely on producing additional errors. So that's also what we're interested in doing is finding a 
formulation of the amphet equations that's more robust in this incredible way. So we'd like to get away from this problem where we have rates one, we'd like to rate two. And the key idea, this is by, by uh, similar to Fermi's equations, is to reduce the total, total pressure, P0. P0 is defined as the elastic pressure, lambda times the vertical CU, and the pore pressure, so this alpha times P. And if I just let E, my big E just denotes everything else in the equations, I'm just putting it there in order to keep structure. Then we have the amplitude equations in standard form, takes this form. But now we move this uh, right here uh, into a separate equation, and instead you'll end up with this three by three blocks. Again, with a divergence of two new remains here, yeah, and now we'll have. It will be coupled to P0 and they'll have separate things. And what's great about this form is that if you take lambda goes to infinity, you can see that this block drops, this drops, this drops, and this drops, and the system then only decouples in the same way as it does in the continuous level into something that's Stokes like and something uh, Darcy like. Yeah. And this you can show is much more robust and incompressible than this. In particular, you can drive error estimates for the displacement and the pressures that are robust in the incompressible limit. And we also have said this numeric. And I like this trick. I think this is a very useful trick both for VO and for MP because you're just introducing one additional scalar field. And yeah, we've done a lot of work that's very kind of mathematically appealing on introducing stress tensors, but then you're very naturally introducing maybe six new variables instead of that. Okay, uh, I can ask it this in a universal case. Um, and move on. You can ask me questions about the employment book case if you want. So I want to end up with a section on how we're using this combined with digital modeling of, of actual brain pulses. So let's now go outside just the isolated brain parenchyma, but look at the brain and the fluid it lives in. So the intracranial dynamics that your brain experiences all the time results from there's blood going from your heart and into the brain. And that blood does not immediately go out again. No, the brain expands a little bit. It pushes the fluid surrounding the brain. So it's schematically illustrated here in, in green. Green is, green should be blue, I think. Green is, is the reverse sign of fluid surrounding, uh, surrounding it. This, Purple is this illustration purple spray. There's fluid compartments inside the brain, they're called the ventricles, and there's also cerebrospinal fluid spray. So blood goes into the brain, cerebral fluid, cerebrospinal fluid flows from the cranium and down into the spinal compartment. Then the venous system catches up, blood flows out of the brain, the brain collapses, collapses, that is, it contracts, and then the fluid flows back. In. This is the cardiac cycle of brain pulses. Of it. And what one actually can measure here are many of these flow patterns. So blood flow, one can measure relatively easily. You can also measure the cerebrospinal fluid flow in some sections. Um, but really the displacement of the brain, the pressures inside the living brain, um, any fluid motion inside the living brain is very, very hard. To image her. So we're interested in, in simulating this. So what do we know about, we, we don't really know that much about these pressures, but we know a little bit. As I mentioned, we have a team of, of uh, kind of cutting edge clinicians who have actually in some patients inserted pressure monitors into some of their patients. It's quite, it's not that unusual to have one pressure in measurement in the patient, but it's unusual to have more. So it's very hard to say something about pressure differences that actually persist in the brain current time. But they actually did that. And what you can see is that the pressure inside the brain will have this, this is a typical pattern. This is the cardiac cycle you see here. There's some respiratory cycle, longer period you see. Uh, and you see that these are measurements in the same location. Uh, and they look essentially the same. But there will be, we've analyzed these differences carefully, and there seems to be a small persistent health style difference. Uh, and it seems to be on the order of maybe one to two millimeters in that brief meter. So that's this 
order of magnitude of pressure differences we're talking about in this reverse final so we can use this as one of the things to validate the model. So now we're considering a model with the also questions for the parent kind of very uh, schematically distributed here, but you see the actual geometry here. We have slopes flow around it. And again, we now let flow, flow, flow into the entire parent kind of, and then uh, in, with this time evolution. And you can then carefully study the displacement of the brain. So this is what your brain does all the time, every second. So it will expand a little bit, a little bit backwards, maybe about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeters, and then go back all the time. You get rather heterogeneous displacement patterns. Um, and we can really look at this in quite detail for different model variations. And it agrees with the few sparse measurements that do exist of brain, peak brain tissue displacements. We can also look the pressures will be nearly homogeneous as we predicted, but it does not mean that the flow patterns will not be. So we'll have rather complex flow patterns in the surrounding, in the compartments, in the ventricles, and that project between them. Uh, and really, this is a, a potential for unprecedented. Yes. Sorry, what did you what say? Are, what are the other conditions that you have for the scope? Is it like uh, sliding on the gamma scope or? Uh, on the scale, I think it's fixed. So uh, on the here, the fluid, I think you have something else. Uh, for the interface, there's some Beaver Joseph Sackman interface transmission change. We could probably have a friction on, uh, on the Dura as well, but uh, I think that uh, there's more, more uncertainties here. I would start that as probably one of the least less approximations. I'll take two minutes to uh, wrap up. So I've, I've illustrated you some of the questions that some of the models were looking at in brain mechanics in order to predict displacement and fluid flows running the brain and inside the brain. And part of the way reason we're interested in this is because we're interested in using this flow information as input to test hypotheses on what are plausible mechanisms for solid transport in the brain as convection time. This is a big controversy and so kind of quantitative, uh, quantitative information on this would make a big impact in this field that's really marked by people kind of just guess. In addition, we're interested in trying to see this flow information still inside the brain parenchyma, the outflow is, is associated with brain clearance. And it's known that brain clearance is important, an important process uh, in connection with accumulation of toxic proteins in neurodegenerative disease. And we have modeled our models, including kind of informed clearance from these other types of models, illustrate how this can delay onset. We can also look at differences between sleep and sleep deprived and so on. So really, this is a hope that will, will tell us more about drugs and it will tell us more about the propagation of um, toxic proteins in the brain. Some references. And thank you to all my collaborators, especially the ones listed here, especially my students and our clinical partners. Thank you.